There was questions from Ram already has a mic, Terry. <laughs> um, yeah, very elegant presentation. I do have a question. Like you, stud you study memory, I study perception and vision. And uh, what strikes me about human memory, um, in addition to what you said about the fallibility, is how extraordinarily reliable it is. And if it had not been otherwise, we wouldn't have survived. It's astonishing how good our memory is. I can say the same thing about perception. I can produce illusions which violate common sense, and then you find out what causes the illusion. But this doesn't prove that vision is highly fallible. It proves, on, under ordinary circumstances, it's extremely good. But using contrived stimulus, I can produce an illusion which illuminates the mechanisms of perception. And would you, would you agree with that? And, well, I, I mean, obviously, memory serves us very well. And you know, we, we wouldn't be able to get up in the morning and know where the bathroom was and how to make the coffee and so you know, and uh, you know, reading the paper and so on without it. Um, and you know, maybe, maybe it, it is that psychologists often like to focus on errors. They're 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 kind of more interesting. But um, you know, in my career, I study errors that are devastating for people because they've. They're, they're, they're the reason we have uh, 187 approximately DNA exonerations uh, that are on the Innocence Project website, people who have been wrongfully convicted of crimes they didn't do. So yeah, may, we probably shouldn't lose sight of the fact that memory often works well, but um, uh, I think these errors are very important to be looking into. Just like planes fly, and most of them don't crash, but when one does, you know, we, we study it to death. So um, you mentioned differences between people and their ability to be uh, implanted or suggestibility. How does that vary with age? Uh, well, there have been, people have looked at individual differences in susceptibility to these kinds of uh, uh, influences. And uh, you're asking about age. I mean, we do know that young children are more susceptible than older children and adults. Also, it, there is some evidence that the elderly are more susceptible. But th those are the only age effects. Um, the, the one individual difference variable that seems to correlate with susceptibility is, are you someone who has lapses in memory and attention? So are, are you someone who, f who frequently can't remember, did I do that thing? Or did I just think about doing it? I mean, I have that a lot with, you know, at least once a week. I can't remember if I shut the garage. And so, like, I go back, and I always have shut it. But I just have to do this. But fortunately, I live on campus, so it's, I don't, don't go out of my way too much. That could be a problem if you commute a long distance. But if you're somebody who has lapses in memory and attention, you're more susceptible. The correlations aren't, you know, they're statistically significant, not great, on the order of 0 0.3, 0 0.32. And that's about the best we can find as an individual difference. Uh, do you find a correlation between susceptibility to implanted memory and whatever might be the index of measure for their capacity to believe without evidence? And I ask that because <clears throat> I don't see much of this in the New York market where I'm from, but when I travel across the country and then I channel surf the television, there's these no end of stations that have just sort of continuous coverage of preachers in very large venues repeating sort of the same message and the same idea in multiple ways um, persistently to, to an audience that is wrapped by this that's going on. And I'm just curious, you were asking whether an implanted memory might serve some greater good. Um, is that easier or harder to implement than just simply telling someone the same message over and over and over? And if there's a sort of a, a gullibility factor, then that might be just all it takes to change someone's mind. Right. Well, I, I don't know that because I don't know that anybody's looked at that. But your comment did make me want to mention that one of the people who was very active in the repressed mem memory business supporting the, you know, some, some of the accusers who'd come up with this satanic ritual abuse. You know, I watched an awful, awful performance by him on uh, Sally Jesse Raphael about 10 years ago, is today making people believe that they're possessed by the devil and they should pay him some money for exorcisms. 
and if we weren't being taped, I'd say his name, but I don't need another lawsuit. So, so, <laughs> so how, isn't there some work that shows that you can possibly distinguish a false memory from a real memory? Is Danny Schachter's work I'm thinking of? And, and, and well, if, well I, 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 can, and I can speak and, to that. And if somebody like Richard was in a Persinger setup, I mean, could they have told whether Richard was having a bogus experience or? Well, you know. Uh, Richard represented the data. He just happens to be in that uh, one group that didn't. But yeah, he's I, not. We don't have to like do a psychoanalysis of Richard. No, no, no. I mean, no. I, we haven't the time for maybe that. Maybe for other reasons, but not 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 because of that. So, in other words, uh, can, but, but, can but one distinguish the, the between the neuroimaging of true and false memories? Yes. Um, well, interestingly, uh, uh, one of the first studies that looked at this was with relatively pallid materials. Um, the that is true and false memories for words that you had heard. And you, you, need to, uh, you need to use these simple materials because obviously you need lots of true memories and lots of false memories so that you can compare the neural s signals. And although uh, some time ago Schachter did report using PET that there were some, that there were common areas that were activated but also some, some dissimilar areas for the true and false memories. He took it back a few years later when he did fMRI uh, doing a similar kind of study. There, there, there are statistical differences between true and false memories, but there's so much overlap in the distribution that there is no way uh, you're going to be able to take a single memory and reliably classify it as true or false, at least not for a long time. Um, can you talk about the, the relationship between the su suggestibility and hypnotizability and dissociative symptoms? Um, one group found a correlation between susceptibility to these kinds of manipulations and your scores on the creative imagination scale, which is thought to be a measure of vividness of visual imagery and hypnotizability. And so there, there may be some relationship there with hypnotizability. Katie, could you give this? Mark Lovendale, a researcher, Preventive Care Institute. One of the things that we work on is the study of migraine headaches. And there is significant um, double-blind studies in the literature of the Lancet Showing that, double blind, that showing that migraine headaches are caused by a delayed type of allergic reaction to foods. And yet we're faced today with a um, medical industry that often has convinced their patients that their migraine headaches are caused by past life experiences. And so I commend you for the work that you've done, and much more needs to be done because this is still going on. It's still a great problem. Well, I, it's interesting you mentioned the past life because, you know, there, there is many masters, many lives or whatever. You know, there are the people out there, if you, you know, if you, if you end up with a past life therapist, you end up with past lives. And if you end up with a satanic ritual abuse therapist, you end up, you know, with SRA memories. And if you end up, you know, with an alien abduction kind of person, uh, you end up getting that set of beliefs reinforced. There's often some sort of kind of therapist or guru type figure that helps to facilitate and, and encourage and fuel these beliefs. Okay, uh, Bill. Yeah. Bill Hurlbut from Stanford. I, it seemed to me watching your film that basically the power of your procedure was in the authority of the computer. And it struck me watching that 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 the computer stood for science in a strange sort of way. Now, what I, in, in other words, that something was telling the individual that something was more true than what they sort of knew by their natural personality. And obviously a lot of beliefs are based on authority, whether they be religious beliefs or scientific beliefs, and they form this cosmology that was spoken of earlier. And I. What I want to ask you, it's sort of a vague question, but how, how do you see all this working in the large uh, realm of what was called in the general sense myth? And is it possible, is it, is it just as easy to extinguish what are 
what our true beliefs as it is to implant false beliefs. And maybe that's what's going on in, in transformations of mythic structures within societies. Well, first on the comment about the authority of the computer, the way we came to that uh, methodologically is the, the, the first of these very rich false memory studies that I did involved uh, participating with the relatives of my subject. You know, we'd actually talk to the mother of a subject. We'd get some true memories from the mother. Then the mother would help us make up some details about a false memory that we could plant. We'd go to the subject, an adult saying, we've talked to your mother, and your mother said these things happened to you. We want to see what you can remember. And that was a very, t and we found about you know, a quarter of the time we could plant the false memory of being lost for an extended time and frightened and crying. But it was a tedious um, a method because we had to go out there and find the subject and get the subject's relative. And every single subject was a very time-consuming enterprise. And so we kind of looked for a way that we could have that authority without having to really talk to the parents. And that's how come we came up with this idea of let's get all these data and give them false feedback about their data from, from the sophisticated computer. And I do think that's part of the, the power of this technique. You uh, get people to think the thing is plausible. You get them to believe it happened to them. And then you engage them in processes like guided imagination, which I was trying to do with Alan, that puts sensory detail or sensory meat on the bones of this belief system. And pretty soon, you got a whole big memory going. And now, you know, I haven't thought much about how, how it might you know, work in the, in, the, in the difficult problem of, of these dangerous beliefs that are leading people to do uh, very bad things to other people. Um, you know, I, I, it's not that I haven't thought about applications. Some other work that I haven't told you about, uh, we showed that we could make people plant a warm, fuzzy experience with a healthy food, asparagus, and we could get people to want to eat more asparagus. Uh, and when that result got publicized, I got contacted by the largest wholesaler of uh, fruits and vegetables in this country. Um, and they said, you know, we got these foods that people really don't want to eat, rhubarb, leeks, you know, and <laughs> can you help us figure out how to, you know, make people want to eat leeks and rhubarb? And, and, and they said they'd supply all the leeks and rhubarb that uh, I might need for this. But what I really needed is some money for a research assistant. You know how that is in the university. But in any event, so I, I do think there are probably a lot of applications, in, and I'd like nothing more than to, to be able to, you know, think about terrorists and their evil behavior that might be based on wrong-headed beliefs and figure out how we might do something with them. But I don't know what that's going to look like yet. Well, let's say let Rama and then get back up to Scott. 